My thesis, to put it bluntly, is that from late Neolithic times in the Near East right down to our own day, two technologies have recurrently existed side by side. One authoritarian, the other democratic. The first system-centered, immensely powerful, but inherently unstable. The other man-centered, relatively weak, but resourceful and durable. If I am right, we are now approaching a point at which, unless we radically alter our present course, our surviving democratic techniques will be completely suppressed or supplanted so that every residual autonomy will be wiped out or will be permitted only as a playful device of government, like national balloting for already chosen leaders in totalitarian countries. The data on which this thesis is based uh, are familiar to most of you, but their significance has, I believe, been overlooked. What I would call democratic techniques is the small-scale method of production resting mainly on human skill and animal energy, but always, even when employing machines and extra animal power, remains under the active direction of the craftsman or the farmer, each group developing its own gifts through appropriate arts and social ceremonies, as well as making discreet use of the gifts of nature. This technology had limited horizons of achievement, but just because of its wide diffusion and its modest demands, it had great powers of adaptation and recuperation. Till now, this democratic tactics has underpinned and firmly supported every historic culture and redeemed the constant tendency of authoritarian techniques to misapply its powers. Even when paying tribute to the most oppressive totalitarian regime, there yet remained within the workshop of the farmyard some degree of autonomy, selectivity, creativity. No royal mace, no slave driver's whip, no bureaucratic directive, left its imprint on the textiles of Damascus or the pottery of 5th century Athens. If this democratic te uh, techniques goes back to the earliest use of tools, authoritarian techniques is a much more recent achievement. It begins around the 4th millennium BC in a new configuration of mechanical invention, scientific observation, and centralized political control that gave rise to the peculiar mode of life we may now identify without eulogy as civilization. Under the new institution of kingship, activities that had been scattered, diversified, cut to the human measure, were united on a monumental scale into an entirely new kind of theological, technological mass organization. In the person of an absolute ruler, whose word was law, cosmic powers came down to earth, mobilizing and unifying the efforts of thousands of men, hitherto all too autonomous and decentralized to act voluntarily in unison for purposes that lay beyond the village horizon. The new author authoritarian technology was not limited by village custom or human sentiment. Its Herculean feats of mechanical organization rested on ruthless physical coercion, forced labor, and slavery which brought into existence machines that were capable of exerting thousands of horsepower, centuries before horses were even harnessed or wheels invented. This centralized tactics drew on inventions and scientific discoveries of a high order, the written record, mathematics and astronomy, irrigation and canalization. Above all, 
it created complex human machines composed of specialized, standardized, replaceable, interdependent parts. The work army, the military army, the bureaucracy. These work armies and military armies raised the ceiling of human achievement. The first in mass construction, the second in mass destruction, both on a scale hitherto inconceivable. Despite its constant drive to destruction, this totalitarian technics was tolerated, perhaps even welcomed. For it created, at least in its home territory, for it created the first economy of controlled abundance. Notably, immense food crops that not merely supported a big urban population, but released a large trained minority for purely religious, scientific, bureaucratic, or military activity. But the efficiency of the system was impaired by weaknesses that were never overcome until our own day. To begin with, the democratic economy of the agricultural village resisted incorporation into the new authoritarian system. So even the Roman Empire found it expedient once resistance was broken and taxes were collected to consent to a large degree of local autonomy in religion and government. Moreover, as long as agriculture absorbed the labor of some 90% of the population, mass techniques were confined largely to the populous urban centers. Since authoritarian technology first took form in an age when metals were scarce and human material captured in war was easily convertible into machines, its directors never bothered to invent inorganic mechanical substitutes. But there were even greater weaknesses. The system had no inner coherence, a break in communication, a missing link in the chain of command, and the great human machines fell apart. Finally, the myths upon which this whole system was based, particularly the essential myth of kingship, were irrational, with their paranoid suspicions and animosities and their paranoid claims to unconditional obedience and absolute power. For all its redoubtable constructive achievements, authoritarian techniques expressed a deep hostility to life. By now you doubtless see the point of this brief historic excursus. That authoritarian techniques has come back today in an immensely magnified and adroitly perfected form. Up to now, following the optimistic premises of 19th century thinkers like August Comte and Herbert Spencer, we have regarded the spread of experimental silent science and mechanical invention as the soundest guarantee of a peaceful, productive, above all, democratic society. Many have even comfortably supposed that the revolt against arbitrary political power in the 17th century was causally connected with the industrial revolution that accompanied it. But what we have interpreted as the new freedom now turns out to be a much more sophisticated version of the old slavery. For the rise of political democracy during the last few centuries has been increasingly nullified by the successful resurrection of a centralized authoritarian techniques. A techniques that had in fact for long lapsed in many parts of the world. Let us fool ourselves no longer. At the very moment Western nations threw off the ancient regime of absolute government, operating under a once divine king, they were restoring this same system in a far more effective form in their technology, reintroducing coercions of a military character, no less strict in the organization of a factory than in that of the new drilled, uniformed, and regimented army. 
During the transitional stages of the last two centuries, the ultimate tendency of this system might be in doubt. For in many areas, there were strong democratic reactions. But with the knitting together of a scientific technology itself liberated from theological restrictions or humanistic purposes, authoritarian techniques found an instrument at hand that has now given it absolute command of physical energies of cosmic dimensions. The inventors of nuclear bombs, space rockets, and computers are the pyramid builders of our own age, psychologically inflated by a similar myth of unqualified power, boasting through their science of their increasing omnipotence, if not omniscience, moved by obsessions and compulsions no less irrational than those of earlier absolute systems. Particularly the notion that the system itself must be expanded at whatever eventual cost to life. Through mechanization, automation, cybernetic direction, this authoritarian technics has at last successfully overcome its most serious weakness, its original dependence upon resistance, resistant sometimes actively disobedient servo mechanisms, still human enough to harbor purposes that do not always coincide with those of the system. Now, like the earliest form of authoritarian techniques, this new technology is marvelously dynamic and productive. Its power in every form tends to increase without limits in quantities that defy assimilation and control. Whether we are thinking of the output of scientific knowledge or of industrial assembly lines. To maximize energy, speed, or automation without reference to the complex conditions that sustain organic life have become ends in themselves. As with the earliest forms of authoritarian techniques, the weight of effort, if one is to judge by national budgets, is toward absolute instruments of destruction, designed for irrational purposes, whose chief byproduct would be the mutilation or extermination of the human race. Even Ashurbanipal and Genghis Khan performed their gory operations under more normal human limits. But observe, the center of authority in this new system is no longer a visible personality, an all-powerful king. Even in totalitarian dictatorships, the center now lies in the system itself, invisible but omnipresent. All its human components, even the technical and managerial elite, even the sacred priesthood of science, who alone have access to the secret knowledge by, which, by means of which total control is now being swiftly affected, are themselves all trapped by the very perfection of the organization they have invented. Like the pharaohs of the pyramid age, these servants of the system identify their goods uh, with their own kind of well-being. As with the divine king, their praise of the system is an act of self-worship. And again, like the king, they are in the grip of an irrational compulsion to extend their means of control and expand the scope of their authority. In this new systems-centered collective, this pentagon of power, there is no visible presence who issues commands. Unlike Job's God, the new deities cannot be confronted, still less defied. 
Under the pretext of saving labor, the ultimate end of this technics is to displace life, or rather to transfer the attributes of life to the machine and the mechanical collective, allowing only so much of the organism to remain as may be controlled and manipulated. <clears throat> Do not misunderstand this analysis. The danger to democracy does not spring from any specific scientific discoveries or electronic inventions. The human compulsions that dominate the authoritarian tactics of our day date back to a period before even the wheel had been invented. The danger springs from the fact <clears throat> that since Francis Bacon and Galileo defined the new methods and objectives of techniques, our great physical transformations have been affected by a system that deliberately eliminates the whole human personality, ignores the historic process, overplays the role of the abstract intelligence, and makes control over physical nature, ultimately control over man himself, the chief purpose of existence. This system has made its way so insidiously into Western society that my analysis of its derivation and its intentions may well seem more questionable, indeed more shocking, than the terrible facts themselves. But why has our age surrendered so easily to the controllers, the manipulators, the conditioners of an authoritarian technics? The answer to this question is both paradoxical and ironic. Present day techniques differs from that of the overtly brutal, half-baked authoritarian systems of the past in one highly favorable particular. It has accepted the basic principle of democracy that every member of society should have a share in its goods. By progressively fulfilling this part of the democratic promise, our system has achieved a hold over the whole community that threatens to wipe out every other vestige of democracy. The bargain we are being asked to ratify takes the form of a magnificent bribe. Under the democratic authoritarian social contract, each member of the community may claim every material advantage, every intellectual and emotional stimulus he may desire, in quantities hardly available hitherto, even for a restricted minority. Food, housing, swift transportation, instantaneous communication, medical care, entertainment, education. But on one condition that one must not merely ask for nothing that the system does not provide, but likewise agree to take everything offered, duly processed and fabricated, homogenized and equalized, in the precise quantities that the system, rather than the person, requires. Once one opts for the system, no further choice remains. In a word, if one surrenders one's life at source, authoritarian techniques will give back as much of it as can be mechanically graded, quantitatively multiplied, collectively manipulated and magnified. Is this not a fair bargain? Those who speak for the system will ask. Are not the goods authoritarian techniques promises real goods? Is this not the veritable horn of plenty that mankind has long dreamed of and that every ruling class has tried to secure at whatever cost of brutality and injustice for itself? I would not belittle, much less deny, the many admirable products this technology has brought forth, products that a self-regulating economy would make good use of. 
I would only suggest that it is time to reckon up the human disadvantages and costs, to say nothing of the dangers of our unqualified acceptance of the system itself. Even the immediate price is heavy, for the system is so far from being under effective human direction that it may poison us wholesale in order to provide us with food or exterminate us to provide national security before we can enjoy its promised goods. And is it really humanly profitable to give up the possibility of living a few years at Walden Pond, so to say, for the privilege of spending a lifetime in Skinner's Walden too? Once our authoritarian technics consolidates its powers with the aid of its new forms of mass control, its panoply of tranquilizers and sedatives and aphrodisiacs, could democracy in any form survive? The question is absurd. Life itself will not survive, except what is funneled through the mechanical collective. The spread of a sterilized scientific intelligence over the planet would not, as Teilhard de Chardin so innocently imagined, be the happy consummation of divine purpose. It would rather ensure the final arrest of any further human development. Again, do not mistake my meaning. This is not a prediction of what will happen, but a warning against what may happen. We are gathered here now, I take it, to see what means must be taken to escape this fate. In characterizing the authoritarian techniques that has begun to dominate us, I have not forgotten the great lesson of history. Prepare for the unexpected. Nor do I overlook the immense reserves of vitality and creativity that a more humane democratic tradition still offers us. What I wish to do is to persuade those who are concerned with maintaining democratic institutions to see that their constructive efforts must include technology itself. There, too, we must return to the human center. We must challenge this authoritarian system that has given to an underdimensioned ideology and technology the authority that belongs alone to the human personality. I repeat, life cannot be delegated. Curiously, the first words in support of this thesis came forth with exquisite symbolic aptness from a willing agent, but very nearly a classic victim of the new authoritarian techniques. They came from the astronaut John Glenn, whose life was endangered by the malfunctioning of his automatic controls, <coughs> operated arbitrarily from a remote center after he had barely saved his life by personal intervention, he emerged from his space capsule with these ringing words, now let man take over. That command is easier to utter than to obey. But if we are not to be driven to even more drastic measures than Samuel Butler suggested in Erewhon, we had better map out a more positive course, namely the reconstitution of both our science and our techniques in such a fashion as to insert the rejected parts of the human personality at every stage of the process. This means gladly sacrificing mere quantity in order to restore qualitative choice Shifting the seat of authority from the mechanical collective to the human personality and the autonomous group. Favoring variety and ecological complexity instead of stressing undue uniformity and mass standardization. Above all, 
reducing the insensate drive to extend the system itself instead of containing it within definite human limits and thus releasing man himself for other and higher purposes. We must ask not what is good for science, good for technology, still less what is good for General Motors or Union Carbide or IBM or even the Pentagon, but what is good for man? Not machine condition, system regulated, mass man, but man in person, moving freely over every area of life. There are large areas of technology that can be redeemed by the democratic process. Once we have overcome the infantile compulsions and automatisms that now threaten to cancel out our real game, the very leisure that the machine now gives in advanced countries can be profitably used, not for further commitment to still other kinds of machine, furnishing automatic recreation or automatic thought, but by doing significant forms of work, unprofitable or technically impossible under mass production, work dependent upon special skill, knowledge, aesthetic sense, the do-it-yourself movement prematurely got bogged down in an attempt to sell still more machines. But its slogan pointed in the right direction, provided we still have a self to do it with. The glut of motor cars that is now destroying our cities can be coped with only if we redesign our cities to make fuller use of a more efficient human agent, the walker. Even in childbirth, the emphasis is already happily shifting from an officious, often lethal authoritarian procedure centered in the physician and in the hospital routine to a more human mode which restores initiative to the mother and to the body's natural rhythms. The rebuilding of a democratic technics is plainly too big a subject to be handled in a final sentence or two. But I trust I have made it clear that the genuine advantages of our scientifically based techniques can be preserved only if we cut the whole system back to a point at which it will permit human alternatives, human interventions, and human destinations for entirely different purposes from those of the system itself. At the present juncture, if democracy did not exist, we would have to invent it in order to restore and fortify and replenish the spirit of man.